done me nothing but good. <laughs> oh, why don't you just give the adversary a good squish in the floor? Yeah, the Bible says that the God of peace shall bruise the head of Satan under our feet shortly. And I think it's time for our adversary, fear, as well as uh, the embodiment of darkness to be crushed. And we are a part and we are the church of the living God. One more time, just clear our minds and hearts as we lift our hands to the Lord and thank him for the word of God we're about to read. How about, how about everybody in the building join me if you're able and just thank the Lord. Are you glad to be in the house of God tonight? It's good to be in the house of God. Praise God. We worship you, Lord, and we thank you. I just love this place. How about you? I just love this place. I just love coming to the house of the Lord. I, I think many of you are the same way. It is so good to see some that haven't been able to be here. Brother and Sister Basil, it's good to see you. Oh, Sister Maria Brinkley, good to see you. Good to miss you. That is so right. And I'm so thankful to have uh, all of you back here that's been unable to come and be in service. Good to have a guest from uh, Popper Bluff South. Brother Lewis is here. Give him a big welcome to this service. God bless you. see friends we haven't met yet. Glad you're in the house of the Lord. Well, lots happening. Lots going on in our world. And we are uh, uniquely positioned. I believe we've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Anybody in the house believe God is in control? Amen. And he is superintending. He is overseeing. Out of a spirit of love, the nature of God is love, primarily love and holiness. And our God is orchestrating, administrating. Our God is overseeing. You have no reason to fear. If your trust is in the Lord, you may sense fear. Fear comes to us. But I'm here to declare from this pulpit that our God is not the author of fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. We are right on track to be everything God wants us to be. In the past three Wednesday nights, we have uh, tried to strategically cover, reconnect, discover, and rediscover the purpose of the church. And it's my hope, it's my prayer that God has, in his wonderful, wonderful way, encouraged this congregation to remember our purpose. Uh, one of the most frustrating places in life is to try to live just punching the clock, just paying the bills, just going through the motions of natural life. And at some point, that becomes not enough, insufficient, inadequate. And you start to realize, surely there's more to life than this. Oh, anybody in the house know what I'm talking about? Even the pleasures of sin. Sin does have pleasure for a season. And it is over with in a little while. And then you start to realize even more. I need something greater than what I see. And I'm telling you the church of Jesus Christ has the answer, is the answer. And is propagating the answer, and it's Jesus. Would you join me and thank God for the message that came to you of hope in Jesus? Take a moment and just praise Him for it. Hallelujah. Thank Him for it in Jesus' name. The wonderful and amazing New Testament church. See, we, if you're a first time guest here tonight, or if you're recently come uh, among us Oneness Pentecostals, then I want you to, to know right away, we don't consider the church the sheetrock and structure. We don't consider the church the campus or the real estate. We believe that the church is the people of God. And the people of God make up the church. And when the church meets in a building, then the church is meeting in a building. 
And uh, we do need uh, to meet. We must obey the word of God and meet. Uh, and so we are the church. This amazing and absolutely wonderful New Testament church. The first thing is it's built on a rock. You remember? It's unstoppable. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I want to speak to some maybe young person that's in here tonight. And you are hearing messages. Hopefully your parents aren't exposing you to the garbage that's coming through uh, mass media. But I'm hoping they're telling you that there's hope in the church. But if not, pastor's telling you tonight that there is hope in Jesus through the church. And being a part of something that is unstoppable. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's Matthew 16. The church is the house and habitation of God. Remember that? The body of Christ. Do a little review. We're also called the flock of God. The body of Christ in that there is function and individual purpose. When the body of Christ is referred to, he talks about the eye, the hand, the foot. He talks about uh, the ear and the nose, the smelling. And he puts together a picture of the body of Christ being the implementation or the place where individuals find purpose. That way the eye can't say to the foot, I don't have any need of you. Remember this? And the foot can't say, well, because I'm way down there and nobody needs me, then I'm uncomely and I don't, I'm undeserved. But no, every part of the body is needed. And the reason why I'm filled with emotion right now is because I know the adversary in over eight weeks time has worked on some minds and hearts saying you're not needed. And uh, even the person speaking to you tonight has been under attack uh, saying, well, there's other venues and other opportunities to hear the word of God. But I'm telling you, I need you and you need, we need one another. Let it be more than human emotion connecting right now. Let the Holy Spirit inside you say, I need the church. I need the man of God. I need the God of God. Come on, I need to work on that just there for a moment. You've got to have the church. you just got to have the church. The church of the living God. Manifestation 
Oh, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost coming on me now. Jesus Christ is here right now. Who have been filled 
over the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the church is no longer a seed on the day of Pentecost. The church has been growing and growing. And oh, Brother Burns, there's about 50 or 60 here tonight. Don't you let that fool you. We're a part of something that is purpose. Give her a big old welcome. Passing through here to Texas. I trust you're a believer. On your way, you sought out a one this Pentecostal church, and maybe you're going to one in Texas. But I'm telling you, if we never see each other again on this planet, we have a hope, hallelujah, through the gospel, that on the other side, there's going to be multiplied millions. Somebody in this house, connect with a big... You got your telescope out? Come on, I'm going to come get your microscope if you don't put it up. Get your telescope out. God's doing something big, something marvelous, something extraordinary. Somebody worship him that's working right now. How big? Somebody ask me, how big is the purpose? I can't hear you. Come on, talk to me. Now, it's as big as himself. He's purposed this in himself. I just want to pause on the teaching and preaching here a minute and tell somebody who's facing a mountain, God is bigger than your mountain. I'm going to worship him right now. You don't know the mountains I'm facing. You don't know the valleys I'm facing. But I know the God of the mountain, the God of the valley, the God of the good times, the God of the bad times. He's been so good to me. Oh, I'm not going to mini mouth God. I'm not going to bad mouth my circumstances. I'm getting my telescope out. And I'm just going to say, God, you're bigger than all of that. You're going to help us. I'm going to trust you. Somebody needs to worship God right now. Maybe that somebody's you. Open up your mouth. You don't know what's coming down the pipe, but God knows what's coming down the pipe. I may not get any further. Somebody needs to worship your way out of that microscopic view of life. And you need to get your telescope back out and say, God's bigger than that. I feel utterance in the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody can break out speaking with other tongues. Uh, so if you 
have been serving God 14 and under, 10 and under, whatever, you're, you're at a stage of discipleship where you're learning how to be laborers together with Him. There's a season in your walk with God when, when going to church, going to the house of God, meeting with the church to worship is your fuel. It's where you get your strength. And you live from service to service. Don't knock that. Every one of us did it. Come on, talk to me, church. I think I'm mad at anybody. I'm just trying to nip that in the bud right now. But if, you, if that's all you grow to, you're going to struggle and you're going to uh, operate on feelings. At some point, you have to make up your mind, God's a Monday God and a Tuesday God and a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He's every day of the week I can walk with God. And then, oh, his presence gets sweeter as the days go by. And on Tuesday afternoon, you can explore the waters and wells of salvation and, and walking with God. Everybody's in a stage of working, learning to work with his purpose. Got it? All right. Now, I'm going to read to you Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We're going to read this verse together. This is really my master uh, verse, and I want to try to use the time I have wisely. And we're going to read it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. For we wrestle not flesh and blood, as principalities, powers. Come on, read like preachers in high places. Oh, thank you for reading that word. This is the verse that really is the build-up verse to all of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, big grand purpose of predestination and foreknowledge. Chapter 2, one new man. Ephesians 3, um, he is, he's forging ahead and spoiling principalities and powers. Chapter 4, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called. Chapter 5, sweet-smelling savor. And finally, he gets to chapter 6. And right in about verse 10 is where he, he starts to breathe a sigh. Uh, and you can feel it. You can sense it when you get into the literary moment. And you can feel in verse 10, he says, finally, brethren. He says, okay, I'm getting there. I'm getting to the point of why I feel so moved to write to you. And he, he comes to this master point. My subject tonight is we wrestle. Brother Burns, we just read, we wrestle not. But Paul isn't saying we're not in a wrestling match. Paul is saying we're selective in our struggle. Come on, you got to get this. You were running the aisles a minute ago. We've got to step up to the challenge and we're going to see how God has anointed this local church to accomplish a purpose. He didn't say we wrestle not at all. He said we only wrestle. Go ahead and project that verse, please. We only wrestle in, in a certain parameters. First of all, let's get it clear. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Man, I feel God's strength and presence here right now. Don't ever, I know I shouldn't use this word, the kids are gone though. Don't ever get snookered. I hope it's not a cuss word. Is it? Is it? It's a cuss word. Hold on. I don't know what that means. It's close to snickered. Snickered. In fact, I'd like for you to snicker me. Don't be some snickers. Don't ever get... Now, this is a bad word. Hoodwinked. That's not a good word. I know that's not a good word. Don't ever get blinded or deceived. Pulled into, drafted into a human struggle. Because our wrestling match is not with flesh and blood. It is not 
in the human arena. But wrestle is understood in the rest of the verse. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle. We do wrestle. What do we wrestle against? Number one, principalities. Power. Rulers. And wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul is clear and straightforward as he moves through the book of Ephesians on these master points. Get them down. God has already planned a destiny for the church. I'm going to skate on out there and tell you this. The church already has not only a destiny, but a destination. Anybody bought your ticket to heaven? Huh? A few of you. We got to pray some people through tonight, Pastor Davis. Anybody bought your ticket to heaven? That means you were repentant of your sins. You can baptized in Jesus' name. Feel with the Holy Ghost and you're walking holy before God. That's your ticket. That's right. You got a destiny and a destination. The second master point was because, here you go, Sister Cassidy, because of his great love and undeserved kindness, God drew me individually into that plan. Oh, in my head, I'm in Tulsa right now on a slatted pew listening to a preacher tell me I was full of sin and I knew it, but something got a hold of me at 21st Street and 129th East East Avenue and when I knelt in that pew, hallelujah, the power of transformation came and God drew me into that plan. His love and his undeserved kindness and through the gospel here it is every nationality I don't think we have a deal here at this church about that so I'm not going to linger there but I just want to tell you there should be no racial prejudice in the church and now that's globally now I'm going to speak for the local church there must not be racial prejudice in this local church. I will not get in a wrestling match in the flesh and blood arena about it, but we do know how to wrestle that thing down. Woo! Man, I'm feeling bold in the Holy Ghost right now. We do know how to wrestle that thing down and crucify it. There is no racial prejudice. One new man, both Jew and Gentile, one new man. The third master point is the church is the we in the text. Don't get to thinking that you wrestle in the approved areas alone. We cannot get into a struggle in these areas, and I'm going to tell you what they are in a minute, alone. It must be a we. We have to get together. We have to come together. It's about us. And when we get together, something powerful happens. Something happens that cannot happen any other way. Praise God. So the we in Ephesians 6, 12, circle, emphasize and highlight it. It is the church. The church. The people of God. Got it now? Now, I'm going to shift gears. You ever ridden in a vehicle that had Granny Low? Y'all know what Granny Low is? Who doesn't know what Granny Low is? Sunflower does not know what Granny Low is. Way back in the 20th century, Sunflower, they made something called manual transmissions. And manual transmissions started out in first gear. And depending on the ratio of the transmission and the, and the differential, there was the ability to have a pulling gear that would absolutely pull a bunch of weight and get it going real slow so you could get it going faster. Got it? That's granny low. So I'm pulling it down in the second now. And I may go to granny low because I want you to get it tonight. If God will use me, 
I not only want to telescopically expose God's plan, but also the plan of your adversary. Just as God uses people. Hurry, get that. It could be a million dollar contract. Just as God uses people, God's adversary uses people. Are you listening? God's adversary uses people. Take some notes here. I'm in second gear. I may go to Granny Low in a minute because I'm going to pull a load. These four spheres. Now, if you're just starting to walk with God and you think, oh, no, he's getting spooky. The only thing I can promise you is that we don't handle snakes. <laughs> we don't mess with that stuff. All right, got it? I'm just going to tell you, just as there is light, there's darkness. Just as there is good, there is evil. And the church that I love and pastor, you've got to know that there's both. It's not enough for you to just focus on the good. You've got to love the good and hate the evil. And you've got to know about the evil to hate it. Okay? Stay with me. The first sphere of wrestle that Paul uses is principalities. Now, in the original text, this is more kin to municipalities. Everybody say local. local. The local struggle. The local spiritual struggle. That's the first place that the church must begin its wrestling match. I'm so thankful for, by and large, a Christian community to raise my family in. Amen. I mean, if you're thankful for that. If not, we'll send you to New York City and let you intern there this summer and you'll come home thankful for Popper Bluff. Anybody thankful for Popper Bluff? Come on now, I need to know you're thankful to be where you are. Farmington, where are you? If you don't have a, a, a culture, now I was driving through, it was one of the suburbs there of St. Louis around camp meeting time. I was driving through there and I think it was there's a, a place called Town and Country, and then there was one more little area there. Just it was, I was in it for just a moment. Remember that, honey? What was that little area called? Huh? No, no, no. It's there right in the greater St. Louis area. I, it'll come to me 3 o'clock in the morning probably. But as I crossed into the city limits, something happened in my spirit. And I recognized there's a struggle to be had right here. Something's got to be conquered. And we know that there's, there's little pockets. Uh, we do have those who worship darkness right here in our town. And if you don't believe me, I'll take you and show you. But they're nothing to us. In the sense of troubling. Whew, because we've already, somebody preceded us. Hallelujah. Maybe it was your generation, brother, sister, Connor. Maybe, maybe it was your generation, sister Parkey, your ministry. At whatever season, somebody came in here and got a hold of that. I'm telling you what we're fighting is drug addiction. That's the spirit that we're fighting. We're struggling in the local level. Oh, God. I believe our God's a delivering God. Hallelujah. And I believe, you've got to hear me, I believe this church has been anointed of God to break the stronghold of drug addiction. Come on, church. I know it's Wednesday and it's been hot today, but if you just
Somebody just intercede right now. Would you get in a get in a wrestling position with them and say, God, I'm gonna wrestle that spirit down. That's right. God, anybody else got a family member with drug addiction? You ought to get in the wrestle match right now. It's called a prince of pounds. Come on, somebody. Come on, in the Holy Ghost. In the Holy Ghost. Come on, preachers. Come on, ministers. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to wrestle that thing down in the spirit. Go ahead, Brother Hampton. Something's happening back there. Hallelujah. I'm going to wrestle that thing down. I'm not going to wrestle flesh and blood. I'm not going to get caught up in the drama of flesh and blood, but I'm going to get in the wrestling arena and I'm going to wrestle that down. I'm telling you, there is utterance in the Holy Ghost here right now. God can do more in seconds than we can in hours and days. And you've got to wrestle that thing down. Passive. Passive is gone. And I'm going to prove it if time and endurance will help me. Passivity is gone. You can't be passive anymore. That's right. I'm going to show you. The second area is powers. I've got to move on. Principalities. Somebody say principalities. <laughs> Equals local. Equals local. Come on. Principalities equals local. Thank you. Powers is regional. Powers is regional struggle. Now, I think in our second year here, the beginning of our second year here, the Lord started dealing with me about this Mississippi Valley. We're here on the gateway to the change and and I believe God has positioned this church as not only a local influence, but a regional influence. And I saw the Port of Thebes up there. And I saw Cairo. Cairo is what they call it over there. But it's Cairo. And I saw Memphis. And whoever was the engineering and the architecture of naming this, somebody had Egypt in their mind. Go get a map of Egypt and you'll see it. The Port of Thebes. That's and right on down. Somebody was thinking this is the fertile crescent. This is the fertile, this is the Nile River. This isn't the Mississippi, this is the Nile. Right. And I'm telling you, an Egyptian bondage. I know what the Lord dealt with me about. But here is a church on Westwood Boulevard that God is mantling. Oh, hallelujah. To destroy that Egyptian spirit. Not just locally, but translocally and regionally. God has an anointing on this church. Woo. Anybody going to embrace that with me? we got to do this together. I can preach about it, but I can't do it alone. We've got to work together and say, God, I'm getting in the wrestling arena to wrestle principalities and power. dimension. It's called rulers. And it's rulers of the darkness. I, I didn't get uh, Pastor Parkey, our superintendent, I didn't get his permission, but I think he's mentioned it in public at least once. We were visiting. He said, hey, meet me down at what's that place down there with that good old car crash? Oh, what's on the M Highway down there. Wally's. He said, meet me down there. I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. I'm on my way. Woo! I'm on my way. <laughs> he said, the Lord has ordered our steps three times. I think he said three, three or four times. I'll be conservative three. I'll be ultra conservative. Two. Two. Our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. We've been there on assignment. And he said, I feel something happening. And immediately the Spirit of the Lord dealt with me that God was giving our district superintendent a national anointing. Maybe I've messed up by sharing this publicly. But I'm telling you, he's got a mantle on him beyond Missouri district. Yeah. Because there's rulers that have to be wrestled with. 
There's not only principalities and powers, but there's rulers. This is expanding influence. Then the last is the global. It is spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the progressive reach of evil. It starts locally and then moves into regional, national, international, intranational, and global. Take a note of this if you would. Here goes Grandma alone now. For every spiritual power structure, for every one of those, there is a material manifestation of it. For everything that exists invisibly, there is a visible counterpart. Let me read to you Romans chapter 1. It's the only verse, not, not the only possible text, but the only one I will have time for. In Romans 1.19, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Bible, at least my version of the Amplified Bible. I know the one we have up there is a little different. For that which is known of God is evident to them and made plain in their inner consciousness. Because God himself hath shown it to them. He's making a point. Verse 20. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is, his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things that have been made his handiwork. What Paul is saying to the church at Rome is God has so structured anything created that if it's spiritual in nature or invisible in nature, it has a material manifestation. So men are without excuse, although without any defense or justification. Got it? The natural world is a reflection of the spiritual world. I'm moving into Grandma Low. Write this down. Put this away. I'm going to start talking about now. Get the slides ready. I'm going to start talking about the evil part. The part that is man being used by these four spheres of influence. All right. Write this down. There are three primary primary experiences in the present world. Now you're going to write it down and think about it because I'm not going to take all the time to explain all of this to you because it's not necessary at this point. But I do want you to think about it. The first involves the spirit of a person. And that is religious. This is the religious experience. And truly religion, religious is the initial awakening that happens probably around, it used to be 10, 11, 12, 13, right in there. Now kids are waking up at 7 and 8, waking up spiritually. We're, we've got children in this church receiving the Holy Ghost at 6 and 7 years old. They're becoming aware that they need God. And that's the spiritual or the religious is what the world calls it. The second involves the soul. And this is the political influence. Political. When we say soul, we're talking about natural life. When God breathed into Adam, what did he become? A living, help me church, living soul. Okay, the soulish uh, aspect of life is, is mirrored in the political. It's uh, beliefs and persuasions. Not so much politics as political. The third it involves the body. This is the third sphere of influence or experience in the present world. It involves the body and it's called social. Social, when we talk about health care, when we talk about all that, all that's lumped under the social, sociology. And these are the three primary experiences that, you will, that will guide your life. Religion, politics, and so society, social influence. How you are raised in those. If somebody's here tonight and they were not raised in the church, the one that's Jesus' name church, and you were raised in some other persuasion, I guarantee you 
It's years before you're totally loosed from any error that you learned way back there. It takes time to learn the truth if you weren't raised in the truth. That's how much religion guides our, our experience in life. <clears throat> now, those are the three. In fact, we have a minister among us named Urban Baxter. Anybody heard about Brother Baxter? He has a daily program called Politics and Religion. You know why he called it that? Because in his mind, that's the two basic areas that influence a lot of people. And so he called it that and garnered attention. Uh, I mean, Grandma Lowe. Can y'all feel it? Good. I want to make sure my gears are working. Religion, politics, society, or social. Now, here's a little history. As early as 1961, Eisenhower, as he was leaving office, if you've never listened to his farewell address, he began uh, a snowball effect by releasing the information of how the United Nations was working in these three areas to charter and engender a new world order. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay. I'm not a conspiratorial kind of guy. I don't buy into conspiracies, but I, I do buy into to principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what I buy into. I bought lock, stock, and barrel, whatever that is. And so Eisenhower released these words, the military-industrial complex. And it shocked the historians because they had been studying already how the formation of the United Nations from the League of Nations in 1945 was working to frame a global community. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's the seedbed. I'm not going to take you on the journey through the 60s and 70s and 80s, but I will take you to 1992. All right, I don't remember all the, the uh, slide order. Just give me the first one on there and let me see what I've, I've put up there, Sister uh, Landers. Okay, let's go to the next one. I'll come back to that one in a little bit. Next one. We've got about a, There it is. Can you read it from back there? <laughs> all right. In June of 1992, at Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro in, in Brazil, a Earth Summit was hosted. Get your Google out and Google this. 178 countries, R.H.W. Bush, President, signed the United States into this, and Agenda 21 was birthed. 178 nations got together and said, we're going to ch change the way the world is. And this is the seedbed this is the, I've not seen bed, that was 1961, but this is the shoot coming up out of the ground, and it was a comprehensive plan of action. I've got it highlighted for you, ready? To build a global partnership, and here's the words, sustainable development to improve human lives and protect the environment. Their first launch was protect the environment. And out of this was born the the uh, tree huggers. The I love you, brother. Out of this was born. Out of this came this activism. Out of this came a a call for a generation that had been indoctrinated in the public school system to take up arms against anybody that would hurt the environment. Okay? Now how does the world, does, I, I like our rivers clean. How about you? I don't like drinking putrid water. I, and on the surface, 
this is great. But behind it all is a framework. It is a global partnership to set in motion what's called sustainable development. Now, uh, let's go to the next slide. Let me see if I... Uh, okay, actually, find the one that says Agenda 2030. In 2015, that was in 1992, so all of the climate people, the message of global warming, the message of all this, just polarizing, distrust. I mean, that you could look at a neighbor and just get distrust over the subject. Very polarizing. And then in 2015, the United Nations, a commission within the United Nations, developed something called global socialism. This does have some communist symbols, but it is not communism. It is global socialism. And this is the social arm, the social arm of this sustainable development plan. Let's go now to that, uh, the, where it's highlighted, uh, the 2030 agenda. Now, if you have a way to Google this, grab your phone real quick. Don't hit my Wi-Fi. Use your own data. It might crash my internet. Brother, check it. I'm pausing on this. Thank you for all you're doing. Give him a hand. He is working hard on our network, trying to help us. Are you ready? Can you see it from back there? The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015, provides, here we go, a shared blueprint for peace, prosperity for people and the planet. Man, I want that. I like to get rich. Maybe y'all don't. Now and into the future, as its heart are the 17 sustainable developmental goals which are an urgent call for action by all countries. Now here's what I want you to Google. I want you to Google Briggs and Stratton sustainable development goals. You work there? Briggs and Stratton? Sister Briggs? Brother Charles, you work there? I found this this week in study. They have bought into this and are willing to shut down their plant and reopen it wherever this commission tells them in order to move workforce into urban areas. Population control. I'm in Granny Lowe right now. I want you to get this, church. This is more than just saving the planet. This is more than just a plan for prosperity and peace. Let's get the next slide. I want to go through these. Developed and developing in a global partnership. Can you see this back there? Talk to me, church. Can you see it? Yeah. They recognize that ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education. Reducing inequality, spur economic growth, all while tackling climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. This is a, is a panacea. This is a, uh, a euphoria in their mind. These socialist commissions and syndicates are working tirelessly on a 15-year plan that by 2030 they're going to have control. Now... I'm only going to ease into this. I know it's controversial, but I've done enough research that I'm willing to stand in my pulpit with my microphone and tell you that I'm on this trail. In 2017, there was a war game created. Find that slide for me if you would. And it's War Game 21. The 21 Agenda developed a war game. Do you all know what war games are? Anybody not know what war games are? Okay. Is there a way to, to see above that? I've got the Insider, Business Insider. This is a clip in, uh, of 
a business insider, a Naval War College pandemic war game in 2019 has eerie parallels to what we're facing today in the virus. The reason why they call it 2019, uh, COVID-19 is because it was a war game that happened and began in 19. Hmm. I've done enough research that I'm willing to go on the record to that. What I'm telling you is there is an evil plot. There is a plan. Call me a conspirator, whatever, call me whatever, but I'm warning this church. The adversary is working his plan. I want to say a whole lot right now, but I want to measure it out in a way that you can receive it. This was planned. Is it real? Of course it's real. We've had people close to us pass away from it. Of course it's real, but it was planned. The reason why they're predicting another one is because it's planned. What is our response? This is what I want to get to tonight. What is our response? Religious, political, social, I'm telling you, Genesis 10 and 11 is coming back alive. There's this Babylonian, Babylonian, Babylonish, Babylonian system that is coming back, but Babylon the Great is going to fall. And we rush to that great, that great remedy, but between here and there, there's going to be some testing going on. Somebody's going to have to decide who am I going to trust in. Oh, I wish my church was here tonight. Not just you. I'm talking about those that are missing. I wanna, I'm going to push your buttons because I want to know who you're trusting in. Our trust is in God. Our trust is not in this system. Our not in, trust is not in the uh, pumped out media. What we're saying is God knows the truth. Now, now I, I want you to, to catch the right spirit behind all of this. Now, giving sharing this with you publicly, I would, you don't know me well enough, I guess, know by now to know that I wouldn't ask my wife, how many times have I done this in 35 years of ministry? This is probably the second time. I did it once in 2009 when I saw something happen just after the real estate collapse in 2008. And I saw, sense something in my spirit, but I sense it again, to, I'm telling you, this was a major step forward in the Agenda 2030 plan. If they're going to have global oversight by 2030, they have to pull the triggers on these, on these pressure points. And everybody is concerned about their health. They thought they'd get the Green Deal. Anybody heard that recently? The Green Deal? That's the next step in some of this. There it is, the Green Deal. That's the social aspect of this. I've talked to you about political. I've showed you a few things about social. The next big deal will be religious. If you haven't been following Brother Mark Hodges in California, Super District Superintendent, I think, of Southern California, an independent, oneness Pentecostal brother in Baton Rouge, Brother Tony Spell. There's been one in the Northeast, and his name is slipping my mind. Um, and one in Canada, among the oneness people, who are saying, in a very vociferous way, you're not going to shut our churches down. And I'm just telling you, it's getting ready to be tested. So are you with me? I'm not going to be belligerent. In fact, I, I pray today. Those three Hebrew children were diplomats. Daniel was a statesman. And these are men that would not bow to a governmental system. And here was their spirit. King, and this is there in the Chaldean in, in language in, in the book of Daniel. Daniel's not Hebrew. Daniel's Chaldean. And here's what... He was, they were saying, King, you embarrassed yourself by pointing us out publicly. We were not trying to defy you. And, he, and old Nebuchadnezzar backed himself into a corner because he got embarrassed. And he said, we're going to throw you in the fire now. And he said, whatever you want to do. In essence, they said, here's what they said. Whether God will deliver us from the fire, we don't know. But here's what we do know. 
not bowing. And we will be delivered from you. I'm out here with you right now because I want to feel your spirit. If any of you are intimidated by all of this, go to God in prayer now. Start now building up a prayer arsenal to wrestle in whatever arena this church is thrown into. I don't know if it'll be just local or regional or national or if we will be affected by the global part. But we are called to wrestle. I'm going to tell you how we're going to do that in just a minute. But I want you to settle it in your minds. <laughs> I think most of you people are already, I, I haven't talked to you, but I think most of the saints of God are already doing research in the background. I think you're dialed into some of this, how deep it goes. I'm not going to voice publicly, but I'm still in Grandma Lo right now. And I want to tell you, it's coming. There's an agenda. Did you hear me? There's an agenda. I need to know you got it. I can't force anybody to prepare in better ways. I can't, religious, socially, politically, I can't uh, force it, but I want to warn you. I feel like Noah standing on the ramp of the boat right now. It's coming! It's coming! I want the Holy Ghost to ring it in your ears. It's coming! And when it comes, you better have your faith in God. Preacher, we're getting out of here before the end. I hope you're right. I hope you're right, but I'm just telling you there's subtle evidence in there and some not so subtle that it's not going to be that way. That's right. And there will be some tests that's coming down the pike. All right? So at what point is obedience to God civil disobedience to man? Write that down because we're going to be working on that in the spirit. I got to know my church is with me. At what point, let me tell you again, at what point is obedience to God, civil disobedience to man? And that's a hard line to find. My brother, Brother Spell, I would have done it different. But he had his own deal, his own principality. It's called parish down there in Louisiana. He had his own deal going on. Brother Art Hodges out there in Socialist California, out there in the left coast, he had his own deal he was dealing with. In fact, he went to the Supreme Court. Is that State Supreme or National Supreme? State Supreme Court before the governor had to back down. They're just going to encroach everywhere they can. Who is they? I'm telling you, the United Nations is behind it. That's what I'm telling you. Right, right. They have an agenda. It's called Agenda 2030. By 2030, they're going to have a plan in place. So the call tonight is, will you wrestle with me? Because I'm going to wrestle. It's going to happen. At some point, I'll have to show my spine. I dealt with it just a little bit before church today. A little bit of ripple of fear in this congregation. You saw some people that were here, they got a report and they left. But I'm going to tell you, at some point, you have to decide. I'm in the hands of God. Where the Merle Drive probably did that. He was the first one to pass away among us in Tulsa. He probably did that. But he's in God's hands. At some point, you have to draw a line and say, no. I'm not talking about patriotism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I'm wrestling in the right arena. Yeah. I'm not getting in the flesh and blood arena. I'm wrestling with the darkness. I'm wrestling with the wickedness. I'm wrestling how yeah. to wrestle. Yeah. Now, if you look, take your Bible. I'm already past time for the kids, but I've got to get this in tonight. Because I probably won't touch it again. Until the next time. <laughs> look at Ephesians chapter 6. He starts talking about the armor of God, doesn't he? And he says, have your loins girded about with truth. Is that where it starts? In the middle? Loins girded about with truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Am I doing them in order? What's the next one? 
above all, take the shield of faith. All of those weapons are defensive. They are not offensive. A truth, breastplate, shield, feet. Then he says what? Helmet of salvation. Is that right? Talk to me, church. You're quiet on me. I'm off of the United Nations. I'm back in the Bible now. You can amen. <laughs> Helmet of salvation. All of those are defensive. But now he's going to end with the offensive where the wrestling happens. The sword of the spirit, which is... I need the church to get a voice right now. The sword of the spirit, which is what? Oh, I didn't hear you. The word. Don't you dare go on the offense in wrestling with me in your own words. You get out the word of God. And you start speaking the word of God. And you know what will happen? It will be like a sword. It will it will take the head off a giant. You think we just make these graphics for nothing? Come on, look at the message. I may feel like this dude here, facing this dude here, but all I need is God's weaponry. All I need is God's moment. Caesarea Philippi, 
Jesus turned to the boys and said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, You're this one, this one, this one. Simon Peter received a revelation at that moment, and he said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Yeah. Flesh. Talk to me, Jim. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't wrestle that down. Flesh and blood arena. But my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you. And I give unto you whatever you bind, it's going to be bad. Whatever you loose, how does that happen? You think it happens with natural keys? No, it's words. And so here comes Jesus and tells him, you've got the keys, Bubba. That's 21st century message Bible. <laughs> Two verses later, watch. Jesus now tests him. He's walking along. And he says, fellas, I'm getting ready to go to Jerusalem in just a little while. I'll be betrayed. I'm going to be delivered into the hands of evil men. And I'm going to be crucified. And the same guy with the blessing and the revelation now said, ain't going to happen. That's 21st century message Bible. Simon Peter said, he rebuked the Lord and said, no. And here's what Jesus did. You with me now? He turns and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things of God, but of man. Simon, you just stepped into a wrestling arena that I gave you keys and authority, and now you backtracked, mm -hmm. and you're working against my plan now. Mm -hmm. right. Your words are working against my plan, right. and you have sided with my adversary. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Jesus loved the cross. It is the greatest paradox. See, you're going to feel like I'm kicking you. But I'm going to tell you before you get out of here, you're going to have to have a cross. The church is going to have a cross. Now, Daniel 12 and 7, I don't know if I gave you that verse, but there's a phrase, and I didn't intend to bring it up tonight, but there's a phrase that captures what I'm talking about. Daniel 12 and 7. Did I give it to you? I didn't give it to you. And I heard the man clothed the linen, which was among the waters of the river, held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, swear by him that liveth for, that is, for a time, times, half times. Time is one year, times is two years, half time, three and a half years. One plus two plus a half. And when he has, when he shall have accomplished, watch this phrase, to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things will be fulfilled. When Jesus was in the garden, his last act of divine power was when the soldiers came up to him and they, he said, who do you see? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Watch, John 20, John 18, John 18. Jesus said, I... Am he? The word he there is italicized in the King James Bible. What he really said was I am. And when he said I am, the soldiers become incapacitated. They fell backward and, had, and were powerless. Jesus just wanted to show them one more time. I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up. But because of a greater plan. I surrender. I'm surrendering to the purpose. Oh, I'm going to surrender to a bigger purpose than immediate deliverance. Pray with me right now, would you? There's a prayer with the Holy Spirit. Pray in your heart, pray out loud, whatever. You need to be praying right now. God, give me a love for the cross. <laughs> Don't 
Don't you treat this trial that's coming as a, some strange thing that's happened to you. Don't treat it as an enemy or a stranger. You say, God, whatever. Come on, church, I need you to pray and listen. Whatever accomplishes your purpose, I want to welcome it. Even if it's a cross. I take no glory and no anticipation of going through anything. I'm just like everybody else. But I feel a strong charge, and I believe God's holy presence is witness here tonight. It's no time to fool around. It's no time to be thinking about getting back into some other venture. No, you, you let God prosper you and bless you, but love your enemies. And when we treat that thing that is the will of God, Simon Peter, you've dropped out of alignment with the will, and you were blessed a minute ago, but now I'm telling you, you're in alignment with Satan. And there's a word of the Holy Spirit here right now. Are you getting this church? Is this too heavy? I'm not kicking you around. I want you to be aware. I want you to know there's an agenda out there. But our God has yes. been working a 6,000 year plan. Yes, long before League of Nations, long before United Nations, and long before the political, religious, and social engineering that's been going on. Oh, there's been a God in heaven always faithful. And aren't you thankful that his love never runs out on us? Come on, church, talk to me. Have I taken you to the pit of despair? If that has shocked you, you're in for a ride. But I'm telling you, I think our church family is wiser than that. I think you're smart people. And you sense in the spirit things have changed forever. That's right. Don't think it's going to just go back to being some normal. There's a new normal already happening. That's right. And it's, in, it's totalitarian. It's, it's infringement and encroachment. And it's a pattern that's going to happen. But I'm so thankful that I pastor a church and love a church that says, God, whatever accomplishes your purpose, put me on the cross. I'm coming out in three days. Oh, it began in the wilderness. Give them some hope. It started in the wilderness. Did you see it in the wilderness testing of Jesus? He comes up out of the water and immediately is driven to the wilderness. Come on, church, talk to me. Are you there? I need to know you're alive and well. I'm kicking. What happened? The tempter after 40 days comes and says, turn these stones to bread. He's on the desert floor, the wilderness floor. Jesus says what he says. He wrestles it down with his words, his sword. And then the Bible uses an amazing word. The devil taketh him. Here's God manifested in the flesh. That this prince of the power of the air had no power over him. But Jesus surrendered to the tempter and did not surrender to the temptation. He let the devil take him. It's a violent word. The word taken there is violent. Not dragging, screaming, but against his will. And then when he got done tempting him there, the devil taketh him again to an exceeding high mountain. Go look it up. You know, when I was reading this and studying at some point years ago, I said out loud, Jesus, why don't you let him take you? Because he wanted you to know there's coming a day when the tempter will test you. And you don't have to bow to the temptation just because Satan had desired to have you and sent you as wheat. But I pray for you. I pray for you, Simon Peter. Somebody's getting this. I may be talking over somebody's head, but I'm talking to somebody that's getting it. You've got to get it tonight. We wrestle. We wrestle. Oh, how do we wrestle? I just went through all the defensive gear. Everybody say that. Defensive gear. Defensive gear. 
Now there's two that are offensive. He said, the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 15, 14. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Next verse. Praying always with all prayer, supplication in the Spirit. Woo! When you get your Word out, when you get the Bible out, when you get the Word of God that you've hidden in your heart, and you begin to use it like a sword in prayer, you are wrestling down. You are wrestling down local, regional, international, and global powers. Amen. Billy Cole told us this. And it's a beautiful thing about the time that Rio de Janeiro was happening in June of 92. That just a little bit later that summer in 92, the Ethiopian revival happened where hundreds of thousands of people received the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, God's got a plan. God has a plan he's working. He said, he said, I was praying in Charleston, West Virginia, and I was defeating, I was defeating governments in Thailand because he had an anointing on him to use the word and the spirit to wrestle it down. All right, Cornerstone, I've been a long time tonight. You've been so gracious. Thank you. Stand with me if you would. I'm on record. I'm on record now. No turning back. I'm on record. We're in a wrestling match. And it's just accelerated. In March, it started accelerating. It happened in November of last year, really. But in March, it accelerated. And now we're in a global struggle. Oh, anybody in this house want to buy into what pastor's preaching today? Oh, God. Come on, church. Oh, preacher, I don't know about it. Just stay along for the ride then. Stay with the church. Don't give up on the church. But there's going to be some people. Ah, there's going to be some people in this church that are going to rise up and wrestle. That's right. I'm not going to give in to the powers. I'm not going to give in to principalities. I'm not going to give in to the rulers of the darkness of this world. I'm not going to give in to spiritual wickedness in high places. But I am going to wrestle it down. Somebody catch this boldness in your spirit. Wrestle it down today. Let's worship God. Hallelujah. We went too long, but 